Good morning, uh, Mr. D. Here, and I'm going to go through the homework on the graph problem that I assigned to you, where Dr. Cecilia Z went to a planet X, and she took along with her six mass pieces, objects whose mass she knew, and she then took along a special Newton meter, which is an instrument. <coughs> she took a nice big one. It's an instrument with a it consists of a spring attached to a structure where uh, this, the spring has got a little pointer which points to a specific measurement on like a big ruler, but the ruler is not measured in centimeters, it's measured in newtons. So, for instance, if the spring is only extended to this point, then what we have is a, a force of let's say for instance three newton but if the object is pulling down uh, with more weight then the spring will extend more and then it points to a bigger reading let's say for instance 10 newton so this is the way weight is measured is by using what we call a spring scale or a newton meter uh, we use the extension of a spring in order to determine how much the weight is or the force of gravity that is pulling on that object and therefore pulling on the spring. Um, and so then it's, it's calibrated accordingly so that the extension of the spring is, that extension is linked to a force that is measured on that, at that point. Um, so it's calibrated in that way but it would be calibrated on Earth because the scale is made on Earth. So Dr. Cecilia Z, she's got this instrument which measures weight. Right now, she's on a planet where the value of the gravitational constant is unknown, okay? Uh, these objects, when they will experience forces of gravity due to the planet, pulling them down, and when each of these is attached to the end of the spring, they will extend the spring in a unique way because they all have different masses and different weights, and then she will measure the weight. All right, so in doing this, this is a simulated experiment, she collected the following data. So in her data table, she has six objects. The masses of each of the objects is measured in kilograms, and they were 0,1, 0,2, 0,3, 0,4, 0,5, 0,6. Okay. And the weight measurements were 0 0.45, 0 0.78, 0 1.26, 1.5, 2.1, and 2.38. Now, uh, it's very important in these scientific method type problems to be able to identify the independent and the dependent variable and the fixed variable. So, if we look at uh, this table, generally in physical science, the, the column on the left is recording the independent variable and the column on the right the dependent variable and we know that this is the independent variable because we can clearly see that the increments in other words the small increases in the masses that were used is constant so it's 0 comma 1 0 comma 2 so that's a comma 1 difference or increment, that's a comma one increment, comma one increment, comma one increment, comma one increment, and that wasn't by chance. So Dr. Ce Cecilia Z, she chose those values, she chose the objects with those specific mass values, so that is the independent variable. She could have chosen a mass piece of 1.2 kilograms, but that was her choice, but she chose to increase the masses from 0.1 up to 0.6 in increments of 0.1 kilograms. The weight comes from the measurements using her mass, uh, her Newton scale. When she places each of these objects, one, two, three, four, five, and six, she places them on the scale. Then going down this column, we can see that the scale would have actually, the spring would have expanded and stretched more and more and more and more because heavier objects were placed on the end of it. So that's the dependent variable. The fixed variable, or what they sometimes call the controlled variable, um, is, and I don't really like the term the control variable, because I think the, it can get mixed up with the fact that the 
the experimenter can control what increments they use but okay in science it is used as a control variable I prefer fixed variable the fixed variable would be the gravitational constant we could have used different planets we could have done some of the measurements on planet X and some of the measurements on planet Y but the planet planet X is a fixed variable uh, the gravitational field is a fixed variable right now another question um, do you need do you need mass in a field in order for the field to exist the answer is no you need a mass to be the source of the field but at a point in the space around it in the gravitational field around it there is still a gravitational field even though there isn't a force there until a mass is placed there all right so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this later on so you were asked <coughs> to draw or plot a line of best fit all right uh, so we're going to plot the dependent versus the independent and then we were asked to choose two points on the line of best fit the love line of best fit and calculate the slope so this is what we're going to do i have brought in the data table right here so that it's convenient for us now the first place you start is with the title the heading so we're going to say here graph of now you always put the dependent variable first so in this case the dependent variable is the weight and the independent variable so this is the dependent variable the independent variable is the mass so we're going to say graph of weight versus mass all right so that's the heading and there would be a mark for that okay so just remember always write graph of dependent variable versus independent variable okay next thing we do is we look at the axes and so using a ruler you would draw a line here and in the exam I don't mind if you use pen because sometimes your pencil might be too light in order to see uh, for us to see your graph all right so that's the dependent variable which is the weight okay and we use a division line in order to explicitly state what the unit is and the reason for that is we're not going to write here 0 comma 1 newton 0 comma 2 newton 0 comma 2 0 comma 3 newton because we're dividing all those record those values by newtons in order to get a real number line so that's but that helps us to actually explicitly state what the unit is of these quantities so the mark there's a mark for the label on that axis and remember we always put the dependent variable on the vertical axis and an independent the independent variable on the horizontal axis so it's y and x eh? like in mathematics the Cartesian like the Cartesian plane and eh? this in actual fact is a Cartesian plane this is the x and this is the y All right but now our x and y is mass and weight respectively so yeah we're going to say okay so this is mass and that's in kilograms all right okay now what we're going to do we're going to start and say okay we are going to now determine what the axis is and there will be sorry there would be a mark for that as well now we're going to determine what the axis is going to be the scale is going to be on the horizontal axis so on the horizontal axis what we do is we go and look at the biggest value we're going to have to record and that's naught comma six right so we have if we look here all right we have got a lot of blocks here we've got one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixty right now if i only use six of those blocks then what i'm going to land up with is i'm going to land up with a graph that's only in this part of the the, the graph paper and the rule is the bigger the graph the better the graph because it's more accurate I'm going to say that again the bigger the graph the better the graph because it's more accurate so we do not want to use such a small amount of our graph paper we want to try and maximize our graph paper in a way that is practical so I'm going to use 
a scale of two centimeters for every <coughs> comma one kilogram. Eh? So in other words, I'm going to say this is this is comma one, comma two, comma three, comma four, comma five, comma six, comma seven, and comma eight. Now <coughs> What's really important is, is that you must have a consistent scale. So you shouldn't start here and make the first, you shouldn't have naught and let's say for instance 10 and then 10.1, 10.2, 10.3. Each of your increments must be constant. So if you're looking here, every centimeter represents 0 0.05 grams, kilograms. 0 0.05 kilograms, 0 0.05 kilograms, 0 0.05 kilograms. That is very, very important. So there is always a mark for your scale. <clears throat> Next, we look at the vertical axis. Now the vertical axis, the maximum value on the vertical axis is 2,38. So I'm just going to drink a bit of water. <clears throat> it's going to be 2,38. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we need to fit in about 2,4. So looking here, what do we have? We say, well, okay, we have on the vertical axis, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Now, it would have been great if we had 12, because 12 into 2.4 would mean that each of those centimeters would be 0.2. But now, unfortunately, we don't have that. Now, you could make it 0.3. The problem with 0.3 is it gets a bit awkward when you want to actually start to work in dividing up that block uh, into, into 3. It right, doesn't land up on any of the lines. So I'm not a great fan of that. But how about if we use 2.5? So let's just see what do we want. Uh, not 2.5, uh, 0.25. All right, we want to go up to 2.4. Okay. So if we did 0.25, it would be 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.751. 1. 1 1.25, 1.5, 1.752. 2.25, 2.5, that would work. That would work nicely, okay. So that's what we're gonna do, because we want to get up to 2.4, okay. So we're gonna say, all right, so what we have here, we have, this is going to be 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, 1.00, 1 1.25, 1 1.5, 1 1.75, 2. 2.25, 2.5, 2 2.75, okay? So now, important that each of these is 0 0.25, eh? Okay, cool. So let's take a look here. So we go right. Um, we also, there's gonna be a mark for that, okay? So now we can plot. So we say, all right, starting with object, with mass 0.1 and weight 0.45, okay? So it's 0.1 and 0.45. So 0.25, each of these is 0.05, so it's 0 0.0, it's 0 0.3, 0 0.35, 0 0.4, 0 0.45. So we're gonna go there and we're going to draw a nice point like that. And with this point, we use a dot at the cross section but please remember that this area here is an area of uncertainty because in actual fact there is always an uncertainty in the x measurement and there's always an uncertainty in the y measurement so for instance the x measurement is the mass we don't know 150 percent that the mass is completely accurate as a matter of fact it won't be it might be inaccurate in the eighth decimal place but it's still going to be inaccurate so that would be what we would say the uncertainty in the mass. We use that little symbol delta, which means uncertainty in this context. We also have an uncertainty in the weight measurement because that scale may not be 100% accurate. There may be a little bit of friction which causes the scale, uh, causes the spring to not maybe stretch as much, or maybe the, the, the spring of the scale is actually has been used too many times and it's actually looser than what it should be over the years, and so therefore it gives a bigger measurement than it should actually give. So these uncertainties on higher level, you would have to actually work out what the percentage uncertainty is in each of these measurements to draw what we call these error bars or uncertainty bars. Bar meaning this width here. But 
we are going to just say that whenever we draw a point, we are going to just draw a circle around it and that will be the region of uncertainty. We're acknowledging that that point's not 100% correct. All right, then we look at point two. Point two is 0.2 kilograms, 0.78, which is roughly about 0.8 the weight, eh? All right, so we go 0.2, we go up 0.2, all right, and we're looking at 0 0.7, a point, almost 0 0.8, so it's 0 0.8 is there, all right, and so we're looking at a point like that, okay. Then we go to 0 0.3, 0 0.3 is 1.26 weight, 0.3, one point, oops, 1.26. This is 1.25, so it's just above here. So that is, there we go. That's the point. And it's okay if it's not 100% accurate because we've got the uncertainty region. Yeah, it's, a, it's cool. You're going to see this is all going to work out nicely. Beauty of the scientific method is that it's quite powerful even though there's uncertainty in error. In it. 0 0.4, 1.5. So 0 0.4 kilograms is associated with a weight of 1.5. Beautiful, beautiful. Goes right through there. Excellente. Right, let me just draw it neater. There we go. And then we've got 0 0.5, 2 0.3. We've got 0 0.5 and we've got 2.3. Let's see, 2.3. Got to go all the way up to here. There, this is 2.3 here. Remember, it's 2.25 plus 0 0.05 for the next increment, it's 2.3. So we can do that quite accurately. We go up here, and so there we go, and there is our, there is our point. And then last but not least, 0 0.6, 2.38. 0 0.6, okay, and 2.38. All right, sorry, so up here, I should have, let's, should have made this, oops, my apologies. That should have been uh, 2.38. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting myself a little bit confused here. So 2.38 will be about 2.4, which is just underneath. It's just here, 2.3. Uh, this is 2.25, 2.3, 2.4, eh? 2.45. So 2.4 is about there. Okay, and so our point is there. Okay, cool. Now. The mark allocation for the points is normally, for your data points, you normally get three marks. All right, so three marks for the data points plotted correctly. Now, we want to draw something called the line of best fit. Now, every single one of these data points has got an error in it. And so, therefore, we need to average out the error, okay? So, what we do is we're going to draw a line of best fit. Now, before we do that, we've got to go here and we've got to ask ourselves, okay, at this, at this point here, at this point here, when the mass is zero kilograms, is the weight zero kilograms? Okay, so now let's think about that. If you, on planet X, the gravity is there. Gravity is, it's basically a phenomenon, and the gravity is caused by the planet, and so there's a force field, a gravitational field, it's a region in space around the planet, in which a mass, if there, will experience a force toward the center of the planet. Now, if you don't have a mass, if your mass is zero, it means you don't have an object, is gravity still there? Gravity definitely still is there because gravity is basically the force field. But is there a force of gravity there? No. You see, so your weight at a point, let's say we're standing on the surface of planet X, like Dr. Z, all right, and I'm holding nothing. I mean, I can't hold it. There's nothing. There's no force pulling on nothing. There's a gravitational field there, but there isn't a force there. There will only be a force if I put an object there. You see, and that's quite an abstract concept. Even our grade 11s and 12s struggle with that one, with gravitational fields and electric fields. But the fact is, for us, is, is that the weight will also be zero. There will not be a force, because the gravity force only acts on mass. Right, so we can, and I'm going to represent it in a different way, we can say, okay, at this point, zero mass would be zero weight. It's not a data point. We never measured it. <laughs> okay, so I'll put a square around it. Now what we do is we use, we draw a line of best fit. So 
If I now go and I decide to draw a line that looks like this, I hope you will agree with me that that line you can clearly see doesn't represent, it's not a good representation of the data. Okay, if I do that, that's also not a good representation. So what we're trying to find is we're trying to find a line that doesn't have to necessarily go through any of the points, but that roughly has the same amount of points above it as below it. So I'm going to go with that line. Now, I can assure you that none of you are going to draw exactly the same line. Okay, none of you are going to draw exactly the same line. That's okay, as long as you draw a good representation of it. Now, this line, all right, we call the line of best fit. Okay, what we're doing is we're trying to fit the data, the data set, which is basically the data set is all of this information. We're trying to fit it with a straight line, right? They call it a linear fit. Now, strictly speaking, if you're going to work at a line of best fit, you've got to work out the equation of it using something called linear regression, which we're doing a great job. We're not doing that. So in actual fact, the proper name for this is a trend line. Now, uh, but we're going to use line of best fit because that's what we use in the syllabus. Okay, but in actual fact, it's a trend line. Now, what I, we will not accept is if people join the points like this. All right, that is unacceptable. That is not a line of best fit. That is not a trend line, okay? So mark allocation, two marks for your line of best fit. Now, you are then asked, so if you look here, you can see it's about 10 marks. It's one mark for the, for the, tie, for the heading, one mark, one mark, two marks for each of the axes labeled with the correct unit and with the correct scale. If you get the unit wrong, you don't get the mark for the label, okay? So two, two, that's five, and that's great. You haven't even drawn the graph yet, you get five. However, if you do not draw the graph and you only draw that, you get naught. Okay, I'm going to say that again. If you don't attempt to draw the line and you only put that in, you don't get the marks. You have to plot the data in order to get these marks. Okay. All right, so now and then two marks for the, uh, three marks for the data and two marks for the line of best fit. That's another five marks, so that is ten marks. Okay. Cool. Now we are asked to choose two points on the line of best fit and calculate the slope. So we want to choose points that are convenient for us. You may not use zero, zero, and the reason for that is in the grade 8 syllabus, we don't want you to use 0, 0, because then what happens is learners start to only use one point, and they just take weight over mass. They get the right value, but they haven't actually used the slope explicitly. So you may not use 0, 0 as one of your points, okay? Not, not for calculating the slope. Not on grade 8 level, okay? So I'm going to choose, you could choose different points, but I'm going to choose points where I can clearly see what the value is. All right, so I'm going to go and I'm going to choose this point here and I'm going to draw a square around it because it was not an original data point. I'm going to call this point 1. If I go down and I look at the x value, this is comma 2, 5. Okay, so this is going to be x1. If I go to the left, to the y-axis, Okay, that is going to be 1, and that's going to be y1. So y1 equals 1, and x1 equals 0.25. Then I'm going to choose another point, and this point here stands out to me. It looks, looks quite, it, it crosses two bold lines. So that means I'm going to easily be able to read what the x value is. So that's going to be x2. And this is going to be y2. All right. There we go. Which is 2. All right. So cool. So this is going to be number 2. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use these two points to work out the slope. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, if we were to move along this line, all right, 
then to go from point one to point two, what, what distance would we have to move horizontally? Now, we call that the run. All right, now if you look at the run, it's the same distance as going from x1 to x2. So the run is in actual fact x2 minus x1. Okay, it's in actual fact, if you look here, comma 25 to comma 5 is going to be comma 25. Okay, so we can, we're going to work that out just now. All right, because I want to use the formula explicitly. If we now go up, okay, what vertical distance did we need to move? That would be the, that would be the rise, okay, in the graph. So if we go across, we see, well, that's the same as going from 1 to 2. All right, so that's the same as going from y1 to y2. So that's y2 minus y1, hey? y2 minus y1. In this case, you can see it's basically 2 minus 1, which is 1 up, okay? Now we're going to use the slope. Now, please note, this is a formula you need to learn. You're not going to be given it, okay? So we're going to use slope is rise over run, okay? which you can then also, you could use, it's also fine to use y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. It doesn't matter which one of those you use, but you've got to use one of them. All right, so let's look at the rise. y2 is 2 minus y1 is 1. There we see y2 is 2, y2 is 2, and y1 is 1. Okay, cool. All right, so that's 2 minus 1. So it's 2 comma 0 minus 1 comma 0. And on the vertical axis, it's measured in newtons. Okay, cool. Then the run, we've got x2 minus x1. So let me just do that again. That was not a nice... Okay, so we're going to do x2 minus x1. So if we look at x2 x2 is comma 5, and x1 is comma 2, 5, eh? Comma 5 and comma 2, 5. So what we do is we say, okay, so it's comma 5 minus comma 2, 5, and that's in, on the kilogram axis, eh? That's mass. So now the slope is 2 minus 1, which is 1. That gives us 1, 0 newtons. Downstairs, 5 minus 0, 25 gives us 0, 25. And if we divide that, we get that the slope is 4, 0 newtons per kilogram. Okay, some people also, we also call this, the slope is also known as the gradient in mathematics. Okay, cool. Right, so there we go. For now, the question is, what does it mean? Okay, so mark allocation, uh, you would get a mark for each of the points being explicitly put on the graph and labeled, one and two. You get a mark for substitution into the formulae. You get a mark for that. Okay, so that's about four marks, eh? Okay, dokes, got four marks. This one was ten marks. All right, so we're already, we're looking at about, um, we, we're looking at about 14 marks already. Okay, so now, if we look at the formula triangle for weight, we have that weight is mass times gravity. So weight is a force of measured in newtons, mass is kilograms, so gravity not gravitational constant, which is an indicator of the gravitational field strength, is newtons divided by kilograms. Ah, newtons divided by kilograms. So units tell us a lot. So the units for the gradient are newtons per kilogram, which tells us that the average, the average gravitational constant on planet X 
equals the slope. So therefore, therefore we can say that the average value for G is 4,0 newtons per kilogram on planet X. Okay, and so this little sign here is known as a bar, which implies average value. Okay, so in physics and chemistry we use that bar above it, like a little, like a little halo for the average value. So what that means is we have found a value that is more accurate than if we had just used one data point. So what we've done by using this method, we have been robust in being able to deal with the uncertainties in each data point. But averaging out the errors, still not getting a perfect value, never being able to get a perfect value, but a much more accurate value. Okay, so now, if you're asked what is the independent variable, right, that would be the mass, the dependent variable would be the weight, right, but now they can also, we can ask you, for instance, what is the outlier? Now, if you go and you look at your line of best fit, can you see that this point here is furthest away from your average line of best fit for your data. If you were to go now and take that value, and that point is point number five, eh? Remember, yeah, if you look here, one, two, three, four, five, six, if you look at point five, if you were to take point five, and you were to take the, the weight value and divide it by point five, okay, which I'm going to do, divided by the mass value, if we get 2.3 divided by 0.5, um, all right, if we get, sorry, 2.3 divided by uh, 0.5, all right, then we get an answer of 4.6, okay. So if we look at, if we had to take this point right here and take its weight value divided by mass value, we get 4.6. Now, 4.6 is very far away from 4, okay? As a matter of fact, if we say, okay, the difference between 4.6 and 4 is 0.6, and we divide it by the average, which is 4, and then we times by 100%, we get that the error is 15% from the average value. So this point here, point number 5, this point here, point number 5, is known as an outlier, okay? So it's an outlier. It's, it's, it breaks, it breaks the, the average, okay? Let's put it to that. It breaks the trend. So the outlier point is point number five. Now, the cause of this can be that there was a inaccuracy in measurement. So it could be that one of the, that particular measure, measurement, there was sloppy measurement. Okay, maybe she was tired and she didn't read the scale properly. That could be one of the things. The other reason could be that there is in actual fact an error in the mass measurement on Earth. All right, um, maybe the people that did that built the mass piece, they didn't measure it properly. Uh, they built it for, let's say, comma, what did we say this, this one was? It was comma five kilograms. In actual fact, it was comma four, five kilograms. All right, another one can be that there was a error in the apparatus. Okay, so for instance, I mentioned before, it could be that there was something wrong with the spring and the spring had changed over time from when it was originally calibrated. So it's important to be able uh, in science to actually try and explain, identify the errors and uncertainties and explain them so that you can then improve the experiment the next time you, you do it. So this covers most of what you would be asked in your, in this scientific method question on this uh, 
weight versus mass graphs. There's, there's maybe one other thing I need to mention, which I mentioned in other classes, and that is the importance of a hypothesis okay, and the structure of it. Okay. So the important thing about a hypothesis is, is that a hypothesis, you can call it an educated guess, a hypothesis okay, does not need to be correct. And that's the powerful thing of the scientific method. Your hypothesis does not need to be correct. Okay? Your hypothesis is, according to the theory of the scientific method, should be done before you set up the experiment. But very often it doesn't quite work there. Sometimes it's done backwards, sometimes not done at all. <laughs> sometimes great discoveries are discovered by chance, when there wasn't even a hypothesis. Okay. But the important thing for us is, if we ask you to set up a hypothesis, there's three important points regarding structure. All right. So point number one, one, it must be a statement. Okay. So you mustn't have a question. Your hypothesis is not the aim. The aim of the experiment was to do this. It's not we think this. No, we or I or me or us. We don't put any human term in there uh, that refers to the experimenters. And it must not be a question. It's not a scientific question that what is the relationship between weight and mass. That's not it. So it must be a statement. You get one mark for the fact that it's a statement. Two, the independent and dependent variable must be clearly stated in your hypothesis. And then three, you must have the relationship between your independent and dependent variable it must be clearly stated. All right. So for instance, an example would be, if we are asked you for a hypothesis, it would be to say the following. As the mass increases, the weight would decrease. On planet X. Okay. Now, it's a very simple statement, but firstly, it is a statement. So there's one mark. We look at it and say, okay, it's a statement, one mark. Is the independent variable in the statement? Yes. Is the dependent variable in the statement? Yes. There's the second mark. Is there a relationship? Absolutely. As the one increases, we say the other one decreases. There's another one. Next year in grade nine, Dr. Rousseau is going to ask you to identify the fixed variable, and the planet X is the fixed variable. Yeah, we're doing it on that planet. Okay. So is this correct, though? No, it's not, because, as a matter of fact, as the mass increases, so the weight decreases. So once you've done this, once you've set up, you've done your experiment, and you look, you see your hypothesis is incorrect, and that's where you then, then set up your conclusion, which would then say, as the mass increases on planet X, the weight increases. Okay? So that would be a correct hypothesis. And what was the aim? Well, the aim was actually to determine the average gravitational constant. So that is not, so your conclusion shouldn't only be based referring to hypothesis, but should also say that G average is approximately four kilograms, newtons per kilogram on planet X. Right. And that would be at least another two marks. All right, so I set up this video so that you can go back and you can look at it in preparation for your exam. There's definitely a question of 25 marks out of 100 that's on scientific method and weight versus mass. So this should provide a good basis for you to prepare for that. Also, later on in the grade 8 course, when we do density, we will look at, look at, at setting up weight versus mass, uh, sorry, mass versus volume graphs for, for data sets, and then we will use the gradient method in order to determine the average density of a substance. So this is a very, very important scientific skill that you require for the rest of your career in science.